people uh, always have something to say about me. So whether it's, you know, don't always want to hear it. So it's the way, um, you know, Churchill put it, if you get to age 60, I'm at age 60, and you haven't made any enemies, you, you're doing something wrong. So, and so. so setting expectations up front, uh, just so you know where, where I'm going in terms of the presentation here. Um, normally, I'm a very pragmatic type of guy, but every now and then you catch me at the point where I'm looking at what I'm going to do next, or what I'm taking on next. And with that, you get sort of half thought idea, out ideas or whatever there. So a lot of this one is what I'm, you know, a lot of this is looking at the world of AI, ML, and figuring out, oh, okay, so you guys can see that I need to do something about that. They got it. Uh, well, I can't, I don't have the cursor because I'm in the presentation mode and stuff, so. Here we go. Now we're back to it. So you're catching me here at the point where I'm looking for the next thing to do. That thing, you know, the obvious thing of interest out there, the thing I've been doing for two or three years is looking at the AI ML computation world. Um, from my point of view, huge potential market. Uh, you know, we're talking trillions of dollars out there that can be opened up. If you can just find a way to get another 10, 20 X performance on things uh, at low power. And, and, you know, if you haven't seen it, there's when when I started looking at the space, which was five years ago, there were something like 10 startups in the US and 25 startups in China all looking to develop ML accelerators, which if you haven't been in the ASIC world, that's totally stunning because VCs have not been funding uh, chip startups since early 2000s. Uh, so you're now talking about 10 startups, at least 100 million each to come around and uh, get going. You're talking about a lot of money even for VCs. So interesting space there. What you're seeing, or, or you know, is sort of my first thoughts. The point at which I'm running uh, MATLAB experiments and stuff to come around and and um, uh, you know figure out things. So you're gonna get a little bit of the um, non-pragmatic in this, sort of the exploring out and stuff, and actually the things that raise points for discussion. Okay. Part of being out in the real world is you come around and start dealing with people and sort of coming around and seeing them. Um, so it's interesting, Thought I'd sort of put down the experiences. Last three companies I've had, I've had two of them had the experiences here that'll come around and do it. I don't have the exact details down in terms of numbers and stuff because we won't do it, but it gets a general picture. But claims, you know, what, what is absolutely true in the AI space is claims sort of go out crazy, but in particular, if you look at claims of hardware architects and kernel developers, uh, particularly with respect to performance, you, you, you tend to see the behavior here that will turn around. Company I was at a couple of companies ago, hardware architect claimed around and said he had the absolutely fastest architecture in the world on, um, on matrix multiply. No one could beat it. I, I, I turned around and started to ask him some questions about it and got offensive and says, not even going to bother him because they come around and do it. I put 18 teraflops down there. It was actually in frames per second or whatever it is. So had the claim on that. When they came around and re executed you know, ResNet 50 in, in emulation, it was running at three, three teraflops instead of 18, uh, which was one of the reasons that company doesn't exist anymore. But what's more important is the reason why. And the reason why was your problem's too big. My architecture is perfect, but you made the problem too big for my memory. Another company, kernel developer, going out an absolutely beautiful job of hand coding convolution. Absolutely fantastic for this architecture. I mean, he squeezed every little cycle out of it. He said, this thing's gonna run at eight teraflops or you know the equivalent frames per second. Fantastic job, it will, it will come around and do it. Came around, put it in emulation, and not only did we put it in emulation, but we gave him the best possible emulation. We gave him two cycle memory. Uh, you know, it, 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 you don't get, if you ever get two cycle memory in real life, you know, you, you've lived a good life or something. So with that one, you know, he was running at 1.8 teraflops uh, instead of the eight. And the reasoning was your memory is too small. You didn't build your machine right for my problem. Um, two unique things uh, about this. First one, being a compiler guy, Roger can probably appreciate this more. They weren't blaming the compiler writer on it. Uh, you know, they, they were both blaming, it's the 
hardware guy blaming the applications area and the applications guy blaming the hardware. Usually the compiler guy is in there in the middle to, to turn around and catch the middle of that, um, which but says both good and bad things about it. It actually says something about this space because it's not at the point where you can come around and come anywhere close to getting performance with the compiler. I mean, you can't even get it by hand, but they aren't even trying to get it with compilers uh, because it's a really hard problem to solve in terms of compilers. Part of why I'm turning around and looking at it. Bigger picture message to me, and part of what I'm going to spend a lot of the time talking on going on here, it also shows they're thinking about the problem the wrong way. Um, we'll go into a lot more detail in that in the, 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 the next slides. But big picture, what, what it shows in both thinking, both sets of thinking, is what they're focused on is getting the scalar version, getting the, the version that runs on the basic grid running as fast as possible. Not the right way to think about it. What you, by definition, you're going to have to scale these or have to be able to run multiple incantations on the grid. The important part is being able to get those incantations, the different incantations fastest, is to put the right instructions on the machine so you can have the next one coming around and going with the next one rather than getting the, the, the base one the absolute fastest. You're never going to have enough memory. Uh, I've been in high performance computing and similar things for 40 years now, and I've never seen a machine yet that had enough memory uh, or that the memory wasn't fast enough as well. Uh, fundamental law there. That's the right way to think about the problems. And the big picture thing with them, with actually a lot of AI, is they think about it the wrong way. You know, it's not a new lesson out there. Those of you who are familiar with LINPAC and LAPAC, uh, I mean, that was a lesson that was learned long ago. Um, go around. Just sort of quick history for those of you who, who don't know. I mean, most of you know the LINPAC benchmark is the one that was judged super, um, super computers were judged by. Uh, in early 80s through the 80s and starting in the 90s, then it switched over to LAPAC. Both of those are based around different ways of doing matrix operations. Both of them are doing an LU decomposition of a matrix. For LINPAC, it's 100 by 100. For LAPAC, it's 1,000 by 1,000. It got big enough, you know, the 100 by 100 you could do so quickly, it wasn't interesting to, to, to measure anymore. So Jack bumped it up. Big difference between them, LINPAC is based on BLAS level one which is doing vector-vector operations. It, it, it does a dot product for the key parts of things. LAPAC is based on the level three BLAS, which is doing matrix by matrix operations, SGM. Um, reason it switched over is because people figured out that performance degrades really badly with the, the uh, LINPAC as you scale the matrix or you know, as you increase the size of the matrix or as you, um, um, you know, add more processors or whatever. And the dug around is actually sort of interesting in the history of computer science um, because Jack Don Guerra figured out from a numerical point of view what was going on in April of 1983. Uh, and he actually wrote a, a program achieving super linear, super computer performance on the Cray 1, which comes around and does it. In May of 1983, I put out my thesis, which said how the compiler would come around and, and, and generate this. So it, he and I have always had a good relationship um, since then. But the key part, the thing that they learned then, that if you ask any compiler guy that does this now, doesn't matter what the processor speed is, it's always the memory that comes around and do it. And the way you want to think about the problems, the whole reason that the AI world is thinking wrong about the way things go now, is you have to think about minimizing reusing the memory. That's the thing to do. It's not the process, it doesn't matter what the processor speed is. If you don't code things in the right way or arrange things in the right way, you're gonna be limited by the memory no matter what. So, I mean, another way of looking at it in terms of the, the LINPAC and LAPAC, basic operation for doing, you know, an LED decomposition um, is matrix multiply. To do a matrix multiply, unless you're gonna be cute and do Strassen or something like that, you're gonna take N cubed operations. There ain't any other way around it. Written the way it's written naturally, it also does N cubed memory fetches or, or memory accesses. You can cut that down from N cubed to N squared. And that's where you get the speed up. That's the whole thing of LAPAC and LINPAC is you cut down the memory accesses to come around and, and be able to do that. So fundamental things there are down at the bottom. Best way of coding for scalar, it's not necessarily the best way of coding for parallel. You can reduce memory operations, even though you can't reduce uh, normal operations. Memory is always gonna trump processor speed. You really need to code thinking in terms of memory and minimizing the memory. Okay. 
looking at this problem, um, this compiler dude from Stanford, a guy named John Hennessy, made this statement a few years ago, talking, you know, 2010 actually, talking about parallelism using parallel computers. You're talking about a problem that's as hard as any that computer science, science is out there is faced. He would be panicked if he were in the industry, um, basically saying it's not possible. On the other hand, this other architecture dude out of Berkeley, a guy named Dave Patterson came around and said, well, it doesn't matter whether it's possible or not, it's necessary because basically hardware guys have given up on getting things any faster out there because of power and everything else. So we're throwing a Hail Mary out there in terms of going with parallel and counting on some software guy to come around and catch it. So since I'm one of the software guys out there that's supposed to catch it, you know, that, that's a little bit of an uncomfortable position to, to put in. But it, it, framework here, what, what is really trying, what I'm really coming around and saying is we're talking about a really hard problem here in terms of doing this stuff. Um, but it is really the sort of the key. Um, you know, on one hand, it makes it really interesting for compiler guys because we're now at the point where you have to go parallel. You have to come around and use heterogeneity and do things like that. So lots of interesting problems out there. Uh, but they're also really hard problems to solve too. And, you know, it, it, so it's a challenge uh, of being able to come around and do that. Little bit of background, just real quick background before I dive into the stuff. When, when I teach a course on coming around and, and um, uh, being able to compile for machines like this and sort of theory behind it. First day I could up, I, I put up a slide that I say the three mantras, uh, you know, the three things that if you need to get out of this course, if you get this out of the course, you will have done everything. I also guarantee the students that the first question they will be asked on the, uh, you know, the final is what are the three mantras, uh, you know, this course. It, it, it stuns me to this day. In my day, it was a slam dunk. You would walk in there and know what those were. Um, it's amazing the number of Berkeley students who, who don't know those nowadays. But three mantras anyway. If you walk out of this knowing this, you will have a graduate level education in optimizing compilers that, that exceeds an awful lot of Berkeley grads out there. Mantra number one, the order in which you execute instructions can greatly affect the efficiency with which they're executed. Um, you know, instruction scheduling, being able to do things in vector parallel, uh, getting different orders makes things, you know, gives you different speeds, different efficiencies. Mantra number two, the way, way you come around and figure these out or do this type of thing, you take a, a normal program written in, written in a procedural language or an imperative language like C, it's going to specify the order of all the operations that have to be done. You know, it's, it gives you a total ordering on the operations. That ordering is not the only one that produces the quote correct answers. Uh, you know, it, it, there, you know, uh, down underneath there's a partial ordering that that has to be obeyed. Outside of that, you can vary things around. So the way you come around and do this is you capture all the orderings that must be preserved for the answers to be correct in the dependence relation. So that statement A depends on statement B. If it has to follow it in anything, it's going to produce the correct results. If there isn't dependence there, you can go around and do it. So basically, once you've got the dependence relation, you can change the ordering any way you want to. If you don't violate the the ordering, the dependence relation, you're guaranteed, at least with respect to the dependence, that your, your answers are going to be correct. So number three is doing a duality of the dependence relation. You've got a dependence between two statements when they both use the same memory location. You know, from, from the point of view of being able to do things in parallel or in vector, that's a bad thing because it, it limits the reordering you can do. But the good side of that is if you've got a dependence, it means you've got two statements that are probably accessing the same memory location. And in terms of exploiting memory hierarchies, that's actually a good thing or something you want to come around and do. So third part of dependence is being able to come around and do that, exploit that to actually get better memory use. And, and I'll give you some examples around that. But we'll, we'll flip through the end of the... Um, my, one of my early bosses was a guy named Kurt Koitzer, who's at Berkeley now. He was the one that coined the, the absolute best phrase for me. He said, I was graphically challenged when it comes to making presentations. Uh, I'm very much to throw things up there. So you, you're going to see the attempt of me at coming around and being the graphic side here. Uh, don't be too amused or whatever around that. But we'll, we'll blip through these real quick. It's you know quick animation on it. But just to turn around, you know, you take sequential 
uh, execution of a program A plus, you know, C equals A plus B, you'll get like you do like that in that order. If you turn around and execute it in vector, you do it in a different order. And if you got a vector unit, it'll run a whole lot faster. Just one of many examples you can come around out of that. Okay. Dependence, typical type of thing. You got assignment to pi and assignment to r. You got area equals pi r squared. You better have the statement to r, assignment to r before the third statement. You better have the first statement before the third statement. But it doesn't matter which order you execute the first and second in. Um, so you capture that with the dependence relation. It looks like that. Third one, you've got a statement like a of i equals a of i minus one. You've got a recurrence that's carried across the loop. The fact that there's a dependence there means you can actually recognize that you can hike that up into a register and keep that in a register and do the store out. Dependence comes around and does that. So at that point, you now have the you know official Randy Allen graduate levels, you know, in, in optimizing compilers, which like Marvel no prizes, you know, is worth absolutely nothing to you, but something you can look at, you know, and be proud of for your grandkids. Okay, a little bit of showing the types of things or the, the statements that are coming up around on this. We take matrix multiplication. We have C equals A times B. Uh, you know, you can see the, the product matrix on the left, the two input matrices on the right. Um, the way you normally write it looks something like this. If you look at the way it fetches memory, you know, first thing it's going to do is figure out first element of C to compute, then it's going to do all the computations around for doing that. So that's what the arrows are, the fact that it actually goes through and, and goes from that. And anyone who knows much about this stuff knows that it's going to execute really poorly. Reason is by the time you, you know, the arrows out there means by the time you get to the end of the first rows and, and columns, you've blown out your cache so that when you come back around the second time, you know, you're fetching everything from cache again. So you're running at memory speed, which is all really slow. Um, so that's the type of thing, scalar execution, you know, not real great. Um, and um, yeah, it's not showing up there. Let's minimize it at this point. Which finding the cursor is going to be impossible to do. There actually is a little cute emoji over there that says that, you know, basically a guy sleeping with all of that. Okay. So next thing you're going to want to do is execute, you know, parallel vectorize that. And if you vec in, you know, any vectorizer can come around and vectorize that very quickly as a dot product. That's pretty straightforward and simple to recognize. If you look at how that fetches the memory, it's now same thing, you know, each iteration of the inner loop is figuring out one element to compute, then doing all the computations for it. On one hand, you're doing them in vector, you know, even though it's a reduction. So it's going you know, it's going faster. But on the other hand, it's going to be memory bound again. So, you know, it's interesting, but it's really not, you know, not that interesting. It's not that great a speed up. You know, going back to the Dongera, you know, the thing that motivated him to come around to the paper that came around of it is D dot or dot product is one of the basis of the level one laws. When you were coding LA pack and LINPAC, or when you're coding LINPAC using the dot product, it basically wasn't running that much faster than Scalar uh, because it was bottlenecked by memory. Um, so that was sort of what moved him around on it. So that one will run faster. It won't run much faster, you know, a little, little bit more interesting, but. So now we turn around, you come around and now look at the, you know, the, a, a different way of vectorizing it or look at a more reasonable way of vectorizing it. At this point, it's actually vectorized. You notice the loops go in order, I, J, K. You'll see the J loop has turned around and been totally vectorized as it is comes around and executes that way. So you, you have inside the innermost loop of vector, the one colon in, uh, you know, is notation for vector represent that. Something you'll execute on the, the, the vector unit. Most likely in is so long that you can't execute everything in there, but it will go through, you know, get the operations like that, basically doing a scalar times a vector for each thing, you know, for those in the um, 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 Blas world, that's a DAX uh, alpha X plus Y. Um, but so now you're getting something that's doing really good, you know, doing reasonable in terms of vector better than the dot product, but still is going to hit some memory bound because you're coming around each time and fetching memory bound out of it. So it begins to look like something you want to look at. I've got all the cool graphics here and I can't turn around and get at it. Um, but, you know, not anything really great or you know, no great shakes around there. 
smarter vectorizer will come around, still vectorize a J loop, but instead of moving that loop all the way in, we'll strip it so that the loop it moves to the inside is actually linked to the vector registers, uh, doing everything in the vector register. So now you're looking at something where in terms of what you execute, um, um, something jumped around here, I apologize. Okay, so now what you're, you know, coming around and doing, what, it, what it's doing is um, um, executing on just things that fit exactly in the vector registers each time and reusing the registers. So it's gonna come around each time and, you know, accumulate, C will actually end up being in the vector register rather than in the um, other things. So with that, it ends up going a lot faster because now, now you know, in terms of the John Garrett thing, you're now going at supercomputer speed. The, the machine he was looking at was a Cray-1. Writing things this way or having a compiler that generated this things got the full speed of the Cray-1, uh, whereas nothing else came close. Um, you know, vector with three EOS, it gets really more complicated after that. I won't go around and more of it. But basically, you're going to end up getting, you know, if you write matrix multiply or generate code for it for the optimal thing, you'll end up something like this, which no one would ever want to write by hand and, and is a real mess. So I'm bringing all this up to come around. I'm working towards a general point here. So it comes around and does it. And, and that general point is it's not vectorization. That's the really key thing for getting performance. It's the strip mining and, and the sectioning that comes around and does it. It's being able to execute this, the strips in a different order. So you got the things that are reusing the memory, that are use, reusing the same data pulled around close to each other. Um, so if you look at you know normal matrix multiplication, so the non pack stuff, I've bothered myself. You know, you can look at it, you're gonna fetch the C's, the A's, the B's, all in a specific order. Uh, you know, basically it's going all the way across one statement. It's what I call horizontal execution. You know, then all the way across, all the way across, all the way across, which is, you know, maybe good, maybe bad, but it's not reusing the memory. The best way to reuse the memory is to do what I'd call vertical execution. You know, it's you pull one chunk out and then go down all the way on it and then come back up and come around and do it again over and over and over. It's that vertical execution that's what gets you real performance on vector machines. That's the whole point of all this leading up here. Okay. So at this point, you've been asking yourself, I've now talked for um, 26 minutes on all this stuff and I haven't mentioned the phrase AI first. And this actually is supposed to be a talk about AI. Um, so now we'll get to the, you know, why, why I've, um, blithered on for about all this stuff. So you take AI, a neural network, it's, you know, general form, roughly, they look something like that. An image feeding into convolution activation feeds into another convolution activation, you know, operations like that, but basic level thing like that is, is around on it. You know, convolution is going to be very heavily optimized. You know, one convolution will run really well over and over, you know, on a single thing. But you're talking about things that by and large are going to be going back and forth to memory. You know, no matter what, you can't do it. Going going back to the original slide, um, it's going to be bigger than fits in the high-speed memory. Okay. So, you know, these things are vector, they're all the things. So, you know, you do the horizontal type of execution on this, you're guaranteed you're going to be missing memory. And that's why people get the performance difference of 10 between what they expect, and, you know, and what you actually get in reality. Uh, there is no execution stuff. So thinking about that, thinking, thinking about the fact that the way you speed up things on a vector machine is to execute things horizontally. So you're reusing the same vector sections over and over and looking at this, you know, the key thing being how you get data reuse, you know, sort of the thoughts, the thing I'm exploring now and playing around with MATLAB is how do I speed this up the same way? So the idea there is to try and go vertical uh, around with that. So rather than doing the whole convolution on the image at the, the, the first part, figure out smallest part, you know, what I want to do is look down here find a, a chunk that I keep all the way through there that I'm going to compute at the end, do the convolutions on just the parts I need to come around to get that. So each point stays through there, I'm reusing the memory. You know, at some point I might have to get the whole result out. So I might have to stop and go back up. 
but doing what I call yo-yo uh, execution, and that it's going to go and die down, do as much, and then come back up and go down again, you know, executing in a very different order. Uh, that seems like the way to get, you know, data reuse out of this, or it's the only way I can think of to come around and do it. You know, you look at what people are, you know, there there is the great debates in the AI world is, you know, if I'm doing something like a grid, do I put all the operations I have on the grid and feed the image across it? Or do I leave the image in the same place on the grid and have the operations feed across it? Uh, either way, you're not getting any memory, any data reuse out of it. I mean, there's some some types of problems where you know one type fits really well, other types where it doesn't. But this is the one thing that seems like it can come around and, and do it. You know, uh, because it, you know, turn around. You know, at some point you're going to have to stop going down. But if you find something where you go all the way down as far down as you can keeping things in memory and come back and build it up as, or in um, the high speed memory and go back up. Um, seems like it's got the best shot of being able to um, uh, to get the most data reuse out of it. So, oops. Uh, somewhere I lost my summary slide, but that that's the big picture of which I, uh, you know, which I've worked up to. I mean, summary out of this, you know, you are now, the phrase they used at Harvard graduation was, I had now joined the fellowship of educated men and women by getting my degree. I now confer on all of you the fellowship of educated compiler writers and that you now, you know, have the equivalent of a Berkeley master's degree in understanding optimizing compilers. You know, in terms of the the, the vectorizing and the, and the data things there, you know, one key part of this. You know, second key part is that key part of out of all of this is data reuse, you know, whether it's any machine. And with that, it's a different execution order and that, that really counts more than anything else. And the third is, you know, looking at this yo-yo approach of being able in terms of the, the thing as being the stuff that can get the, uh, has the possibility of getting the data reuse that could come around and, uh, you know, have a, have a chance of getting the, you know, it, it's, in some ways, it's a good thing. It's in some ways a bad thing. So the, the the standard approach for the 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 guys going out and building ML accelerators is a couple of hardware guys get together. They think they have a new way of doing hardware that no one has ever thought of before. They have they have you know they've got a better way of doing memory contention or they have have a faster uh, synchronization scheme or whatever. So they go out. They get a hundred billion dollars or so of VC money. They go build the chip. They go to everyone, they can get 100x performance, what everyone gets out there. They get it back. They then try to run something and they find it runs at 100th of what they thought because they haven't thought about software. They now burned $100 million. They got VCs expecting product, uh, you know, waiting to get sales. The only thing holding up in sales is software and, and they panic. So at that point, it's who are you going to call? You know, it's I, I put myself out there that, you know, the good side of that is, I can make a lot of money, really, you know, a lot of money, really, for a short period of time, uh, trying to bail them out. You know, it's, it, I, the company either goes belly up or the CEO gets pissed off at me because uh, I'm telling him all the things you do wrong. But you know, it, it really is that stage that repeats over and over with these guys. It, it, it's uh, so it's going to take something, some compiler stuff, something like this that comes around that is going to make this stuff successful. Uh, otherwise, you're going to see, you know, of the last three companies I worked for, two are belly up. When I consulted that before that was belly up. So it's, uh, you know, the, 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 the time is coming around there. So those were the three lessons. Hit it a little short, but we got lots of time for questions. I, I, I'm a man who can expound on many things if you wish. Um, so with that, and I've been around for a while, as you can tell, for the gray hair. So happy to answer any sort of questions that people might have. So. Hi, I'm, I'll just introduce myself because I'm new here at uh, uh, the Conference for Computing Center since this week. So, oh, okay. I'm Marcia Grazos, and I, I was about 30 years at Harvard, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> and at Rice University, well, that might be a bit right. Well, we, we have many things in common, then. So, yeah, things in common. But I, I just was, uh, is my gap anything to do with that? Uh, with the um, the review the data re uh, reviews that we were talking about, but I just wondered how it compares to tools like Map Reviews in terms of like shadowing the data and then bringing it back. 
So, um, because of, at least for, for a lot of the computation for very large data. Uh, that, 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 that has been the way of coming around and doing things. Yeah, I mean, that, that, you know, that, that has been one of the standard primitives that people have used for a long time. The question, just in case you couldn't hear it online, is how this stuff compares to, to MapReduce and stuff. Uh, I mean, this, I mean, you know, MapReduce is a nice primitive and stuff, but it's an abstraction built on top of, of this. And, uh, you know, this, this is the thing that really makes it run that fast if you're going to do it. You know, either someone implements MapReduce in a way that does this, or you go and do it automatically, at, at least from what I've seen. So, makes sense? Seem like a reasonable answer yeah, to you? Yeah, yeah. No, yes. Well, at least in some areas, MapReduce broadly has been broadly used. That's why I'm well, it, it, it's broadly used because it's easy to, you know, <laughs> well, it's an easy abstract and think of it, you know, and, and MapReduce. I mean, I think the first computer I can remember it being used on was a connection machine, uh, which, you know, shows my age. Uh, you know, it's like 1990. Uh, you know, this massive, one of the massive parallel processors that came out. When, when you're looking at something, you know, it's one of the first ones that had like a thousand processors on it. And we're looking at how you program that and how you get the things out and coming back. That That's a natural primitive to have. You can't, you know, you definitely can't write a, for that type of processor, a for loop that, you know, spawns sp sp off across a thousand processors very quickly, or you couldn't back then. Which, going to the Rice type of thing. So one of the founders of Connection Machines was Danny Hillis, and you probably didn't overlap Preston Briggs. Well, I was in the Sophia space. Uh, space uh, okay. Uh, well, one of those pieces of trivia that's locked up in this brain is that Danny Hillis was a cousin of Danny Hill, uh, Preston Briggs, who other ones will know here. Preston Briggs did the register allocator and also wrote the vectorizer in LOVM, uh, was cousin of Danny Hillis, who's now at Disney doing stuff after thinking machines um, at belly up. So. Mm -hmm. okay. other, other questions? questions? More questions online. I have a question. Fire away. So. Why not use AI to learn or try to figure out this memory minimization process? You know, you, that, it's an interesting question from a, a different point of view. When, when I was at Mentor was when AI was coming out. And all the EDA types were coming around and saying, oh, we'll go use AI to come around and, and do this. From what I, you know, so AI, the way it composed now, looks at what a human does and figures out the patterns or whatever uh, among it. it. It assumes the human knows what he's doing. Um, you know, if you got, you know, things that are clearly algorithmic, there's makes no sense for AI because you can come around and program it directly. Things that a human can do but don't realize, like look at a ball and realize it, that it is a ball and not something else. AI can come around and look at. But if you look at something like EDA or the the memory mapping problem, where the human doesn't know what it's, you know, doing, uh, the program's just guess. You know, an AI program's just guessing exactly the same way the the human does on, on most of the stuff. So. We have an opportunity to create a. I mean, the challenge with AI is creating the right type of conditions. Right. Yeah. And then figuring out what ecosystem is around that supervised learning, blah, blah, blah. Right. So there's all an interesting question of understanding if you can create the parameter space and, and constraints such that you can get there. So that, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Uh, a lot of things that we're doing now here is looking at sparse workloads and trying to understand how to minimize or actually improve efficiency. Um, maximize reuse, those types of things. So it's again along the same lines just from the architecture space. So yeah. we take what your perspective is and where we want to go with future research on the architecture, it's a, it's a fantastic match. Yeah. Uh, putting it into this, all the domains now is the same. So I think the fun fact for me is the kernels are the same as you're alluding to, but the applications are different. And so that gives us broad applicability. No, I mean, it, you know, so it's not like, um... Part of why I come around and look this way. It's not like having a fast convolution is only good for AI or fast, you know, exactly, exactly. people have been trying to run matrix exactly. multiply yeah. and convolution in parallel. A lot of really smart people have worked really hard, yeah. a lot smarter than me, have worked hard for 40 years to figure out how to do that. And they ain't figured it out. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, not going to come around on that. I mean, the, the, the other side is also recognizing the limits 
uh, of AI. The, the, the one I liked the best, um, it, was, uh, it was on LinkedIn, but um, they put the, the equality, the limit of one over one X minus eight as X approaches eight equals infinity. Okay. Mm -hmm. So from that, an AI program concluded that the limit of one over X minus five as X approaches five is equal to five turn, you know, infinity is an eight turned on its side. So it put a five turned on its side uh, around on that. It, you know, that, that there are, it's only as good as what you put into it. And it's really easy for people to overestimate it. Yeah, garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. I think that's the first thing and leave these things on chat and PT or whatever, fit in that space. Yeah. Carlos, you have your hand up and have a question, please. Hi, thanks for uh, your talk and for your time. Uh, my question was um, a little bit about your opinion on whether we're going to, at some point, get uh, closer to being able to express 